uh, it was originally written in 1982, and then he uh, created another updated version in 2002, which is the one I read, uh, where he shows how you can use functional programming to sort of uh, decompose um, Escher's woodcutting and then recompose it using functional programming. And I thought that was really neat. Uh, yeah, so he says that an algebra of uh, pictures is described that is sufficiently powerful to denote the structure of a well-known Escher woodcut square limit. Um, yes. And let's see, let's do this uh, like so. So what it says is that a picture is an example of a complex object that can be described in terms of its parts. And he uh, goes on to argue that we can uh, picture of uh, envision uh, a picture as a function which takes uh, three arguments, um, which are vectors, and then research, uh, returns a set of graphical objects that can be rendered on some output device. Could be a printer, could be a screen. Uh, so we have, basically, I'm, I'm going to use an Elm-like syntax for this. Uh, unfortunately, there is no Scala in this talk. Uh, there is only Elm uh, or Elm-like stuff, and then mostly PostScript later on. Um, what we got to work with is, um, a picture, and a picture is a function from uh, a box, which is made of, uh, uh, of three vectors, to some rendering. And a box, yeah, you can see that. Those would be the three vectors. So how this, uh, is this going to work? This is uh, uh, a picture, uh, and this is the box. So you have this uh, picture of a stick man, George, that is rendered inside uh, this bounding box that we give to the picture. So. What we could do is we can sort of skew this box, and then this George picture is going to have to render himself inside whatever box I give him. So I can give him sort of a tall skewed box, or I can give him sort of a squishing box, and he sort of has to cope with whatever space I give him. Um, yes. So that's kind of interesting, because uh, this gives us uh, an easy way to do simple transformations on pictures. So for instance, we might want to take a picture and then turn it 90 degrees, like as shown here. And we can do that just by manipulating these boxes. Right? So I can have a function turn box that does a little bit of simple vector arithmetic. Uh, and we can use that to implement a turn function for the box. So I, uh, turn is going to uh, be a function from a picture to a picture. Uh, turn box is a function from a box to a box, and then I can use func uh, composition of functions to sort of squish these together uh, because, well, turn box is a function from a box to a box. And if you remember, a picture is just a function from a box to a rendering, so they fit together to form another picture. So what really is going on sort of under the hood is, I, okay, I, I have this original box, but uh, just before I pass it to my F picture, I'm just going to turn it and that sort of gives me a new picture, which is the, the turned one. And I can do that as many times as I like. A turn is sort of composes nice with itself because it's a picture, uh, picture to picture function. So I can turn it twice, three times, or four times, and then I might want to stop because, well, we're back where we started. So that's the first transformation. Another one would be to flip the picture like so. I can do that also with just a simple box transformation. So exactly the same pattern, if you like. So I just flip the box, which is adding uh, two vectors and then uh, having my original uh, B vector going in the opposite direction. That's going to flip the box. So when I say that I add two vectors together, that's going to be that one and that one, which takes me over there. And then I negated the B vector so that points that way, and I leave the C vector intact. And I can only do that two times before I end up where I started. Now the third uh, simple transformation that Henderson defines in his paper is something he calls ROT45, and I, I like to call it TOS because it looks like you're sort of throwing up uh, into the air. And this is a little bit more involved with uh, vector stuff, but not, nothing too difficult. Um, and again, I just take the box transformation and compose it with my original picture. Now to understand what's, what's going on, I'm, I'm going to draw 
here is sort of the original box and the tossed one. So you can see there's a sort of reduction uh, by, uh, uh, yeah. Now, interestingly, um, we, so we have these three simple transformations. Uh, we also like to uh, create more complex pictures by composing uh, several pictures. So I might take two pictures, my origi original George picture and a picture of John, uh, George turned twice over and compose those using uh, a combinator called above. So that's just going to uh, sort of use half the space for the first picture and half the space for the second picture. And I have a, a generalized uh, function to um, give sort of a, a weight or a ratio to each picture. So the above uh, fig, uh, function is just going to give equal weights to each picture. But if I wanted to, I could give most of the space to the first picture and then just a little space for, to the second one. But it's important to, to sort of uh, realize that um, once I've done this composition, all I have is a picture. There's nothing particular with that. So it's sort of closed uh, over the means uh, of composition, this abstraction, right? So this is just another picture. Inside, it's going to split the box I give it and then sort of pass it to each, each picture. But we don't really care about that. It, it sort of has its own identity now which is sort of this mirror George picture. And I can do things with that picture as well, right? So one of the things I might do is that I might use this above ratio thing that gives a weight of two to the uh, composed picture and a weight of one to just George. And then I have sort of this evenly spaced thing. Similarly, uh, I have a beside uh, function to combine two, or basically we just put two pictures next to each other, and I can do the same trick here. Um, one more uh, way of combining things, a quartet takes four pictures and creates a two by two grid of those pictures. And these are now really simple to create, right? Because I have these above and beside uh, functions. So there is nothing sort of uh, nothing uh, weird going on with boxes anymore. I can just use this sort of higher level composition things. And again, this is just a picture. I can toss it up into the air if I like. Um, yeah, so similar to uh, Quartet is a no net, which takes nine pictures and creates a, a three by three grid of it. So I have the letters uh, H, E, N, and so forth, and I create a known it out of it. And again, this is, again, very simple. So I create a row and a column, and I combine everything together. And again, uh, sort of important uh, lesson in this paper is that every time I've composed some picture, I just have a picture and I can do whatever I like with it, like create something like this. Uh, finally, uh, this, uh, what we wanted to create was uh, this artwork by Escher, so we need a fish picture as well. And I can compose fish pictures using um, well, some more combinators. Uh, over is a kind of a uh, weird one, which just takes two pictures and draws both of them inside the same box. So it sort of overlays them. That mostly doesn't work well because, well, everything gets cluttered. But for this fish, it sort of turns out nicely because, well, Escher designed the original fish, right? But what's really going on is, okay, I take a box and I draw each picture inside the same box. And again, Escher designed this fish so it fits nicely with uh, variations of itself. Um, one of the basic building blocks um, in the paper is called a T-tile. And I don't know why it's called a T-tile, but I'm going to use that name. Um, and again, it's simple transformations that we just defined, right? So I take whatever picture I originally was given and I toss and flip it and whatever uh, I got from that, I turned three times over, um, 
and I'd render everything on top of each other. That renders the T tile like so. And another uh, basic building block is the U tile. And again, it fits nicely with itself, this fish. And this is also just simple transformations. Toss and flip and then turn uh, in various degrees. And that gives us the U tile. Uh, with these building blocks, we have enough to do the recursion itself. So we're going to need two kinds of recursions. One is to create uh, a side in uh, the finished picture. Um, the sort of base case is very simple, just the blank picture. So you give a picture that you give a box but does nothing with it. Um, but at step one, you can see that we're going to have a T-tile and a turned T-tile. And then, if you can imagine, up there, there are two blanks as well. But we can't really see blanks. But inside those blanks, we're going to put recursive copies, like so. So whatever I had down here, I put two recursive copies in the blank spaces. And now I have more blank spaces that I can sort of keep on putting copies inside. And that's going to look like this. So uh, basic case, blank. Otherwise, we're going to do some recursion. And that recursion is going to use this quartet thing that I showed you. So uh, for the step one, I said that it was a turn T tile and a T, and then blanks on top. And similarly, for the corner, it starts out uh, easily. Just the U tile. Well, it starts out with a blank. Then I get a U tile. But then I have both a side recursion and a corner recursion really going on. So I put a copy of side and a turned copy of side, and then uh, the corner itself, like so. So it grows out like that. So you can see, again, I'm using this quart thing to create a two by two grid. And I have a corner recursion and a side recursion. And then the U tile as well. And that's really all we need for this square limit thing. So I start with the U tile, and then I have variations of corner and side. It allows me to sort of grow outward like this. And with these uh, uh, functions that we have defined, defining square limit itself is really quite straightforward. So I have the U tile, four variations of a corner, four variations of a side, and then I just compose it into this three by three grid that we had. So it's it's quite elegant, and this is now Henderson's reproduction of uh, Escher's square limit. It's, it's quite nice to look at. It has sort of the same recursive structure. Now, uh, towards the end of the paper, I was reading uh, that a picture needs to be rendered on a printer on a screen uh, by a device that expects to, give, uh, to be given some sequence of commands. And it says also that programming the sequence uh, directly is much harder than having some application that generates these commands automatically. And finally, it said that the pictures in uh, Henderson's paper were drawn by a Java program which generated PostScript's command directly. And the Java was written in a functional style so that the definitions were executed uh, exactly as they appear in the paper. And I was thinking, okay, Java, um, that's fine. Um, Perhaps, well, prob probably the, a good option uh, in 2002, I don't know. Uh, but I was curious because um, it didn't seem to me that Java was the, maybe the best uh, option for doing the functional programming. You could do that in PostScript as well. So rather than having a JavaScript program generate uh, PostScript commands, I, I wanted to create a PostScript program that could create PostScript commands. Uh, and then I wrote this postscript in a functional style that were, well, perhaps not exact as they appear in the paper, but, but quite similar. Uh, yes. Now, one of the things that's kind of endearing with postscript is that uh, when you read the books on postscripts, they're not really uh, as boisterous as, as books uh, about other programming languages. So it says, it, this is the first sentence in uh, thinking, uh, thinking in PostScript. It's probably true that PostScript is not everyone's first choice as a programming language. But so let's put that premise behind us and assume that you need to or want to write a program in the pro PostScript language. Right. So 
with that, let's, let's take a look at PostScript. So PostScript is, uh, it's a weird language. Um, it is dynamically typed and dynamically scoped. Um, it is kind of hard to live code in because, uh, well, uh, usually uh, when I write programs, I like to rely on the type checker to, to catch up some of my, my mistakes. Uh, well, but it's dynamic language, so it's not going to do that for me. Uh, if I can't do that, I'm going to throw a lot of unit tests on it. Uh, unfortunately, there are no unit test frameworks for PostScript. So, um, uh, well, it's, it's rough. Um, uh, but let's, let's not worry about that. Let's do a simple, uh, let's see. We're going to need uh, sort of a hello world case, right? We need to, to get started with the PostScript. Um, so let's see. Uh, yes, I want to say hello Scala IO. So this is a string. Um, let's see if this works at all. Oh, this is, oh well. Uh, it's probably going to work, but I want to put it a bit more centered on the page. So let's take a look, let's see if anything happened at all. Yes, hello, Scala IO. Hi. Um, so um, PostScript is very nice for drawing things. Um, and it has this nice things where you can rotate the coordinates and stuff like that. So I can, oh wow. Well. Yeah, nice. Uh, yes. But of course you can do other things in, in, uh, in PostScript as well. Uh, so basically, it's it's a concatenative language, right? So it's uh, you do all the programming on your on the stack. So it's a uh, uh, unusual if you're used to uh, um, well anything really. Uh, <laughs> if you're used to uh, the, the writing bytecode for the JVM directly, then it's us then it's not so unusual. But well, usually we don't do that. Um, but okay, so we have a stack. I can put things on the stack like so. And I can, so I pushed a one on the stack and then a two on the stack and then I can see I have a stack of two things. And I can put all kinds of weird stuff on there. So, I don't know. What do we have now? So we have uh, two numbers, a Boolean value, a string, and then array with some different kinds of stuff in it. So, the arrays are dynamically typed. You can put anything you like in there. And then, of course, you can do uh, stuff like duplicate things on the stack, popping things from the stack. Um, one thing, well, you have all of, because you're working with the stack, you have all these operators to, to manipulate it. So one thing I might want to do is I might want to roll the stack. So I can take, in this case, th the top three elements and roll it once over. So let's see the effect of that. So I started with the array on top, but now I sort of rolled it, these three elements, I rolled it uh, so that I put this one down here. And I can go the other way around as well. This is going to give me whatever I had before. Okay, so lots of uh, st stack manipulation things. I can also do arithmetic. Uh, so I push some numbers onto the stack, and then I can add two numbers together. Uh, maybe I can subtract. So now I subtracted uh, 4 minus 13. I can negate. Uh, well, doing simple math like that. I can multiply. I can, well, divide. So that was an integer division. Yeah. Um, OK, so that's what you expect, I guess. Um, I was talking about arrays, and I wanted to show you a little bit more of arrays. I think I'm going to use my cheat sheet here so that I don't forget what I wanted to show you. So again, this is an array. Um, one thing I might want to do with an array is take a look at the individual elements. One uh, sort of 
fast way to do that is I can do a load, which is just going to put whatever I had in my array onto the stack and then leave a copy of the array itself onto the stack as well. Um, okay, is that interesting? Maybe, I don't know. Um, I can create a new array like so. So this is going to give me a size two array with nothing in it. And then I can use a store, which is kind of clever. It's going to take whatever however many elements I need from the rest of the stack and push it into the array that I have. Okay, mm, yes. Now something unusual uh, and weird uh, and pretty cool is uh, I can put uh, a marker, a sort of a start of array marker onto the stack itself. And then I can roll, as I showed you earlier, to push this mark down there. And then if I finish my array, I put everything inside the array. So I can sort of eat things from the stack and put it into my array. So that's nice, um, yes. And it gets weirder. Um, so, let's see, yeah. So I'm gonna push a value. Now add is the name of a sort of built-in operator in, in, uh, in PostScript. Uh, so I'm gonna load uh, the procedure body of add, if you like, onto the stack. And let's see, what do I have here now? Yeah, I have two numbers, so I might add them together. Um, now, if I have a procedure body on the top of my stack and can execute it, right? So this is going to be similar to having just written four or five and add. But this uh, tells me that I can do sort of higher order procedure thing, higher order function things by loading the procedure bodies themselves onto the stack. Um, yes. So again, I have five and add. Then I'm gonna use this trick where I put uh, this into an array now. Really weird thing about PostScript is that I can turn an array into an ex executable array. What does that mean? That means that suddenly this is a procedure now, something that can be executed. Oh yeah, and I didn't really show you this, but uh, sort of the most basic uh, stack manipulation thing I can do is exchange or swap elements onto the stack. Right, so I can execute um, my procedure that used to be just an array, which is now an executable array, which is the same as a procedure body. Um, yes, so that's kind of nice. Uh, let's see how we are for time. I can exploit this uh, with a little trick. So I can create a function called a make adder. Now this CVX thing is a thing that has the uh, sets the executable bit uh, on, or, uh, on an array or on a name. So in this case, I'm gonna put it on a name. So I'm gonna say, okay, this is this is my name, but by itself the name will evaluate to itself as you try to execute it. But if you set the executable bit, then it's actually going to call um, the procedure itself when you execute it. So what is this trick? Let's see, what do I have? Yes, I forgot to say def. So what really is going on here is I'm saying make adder which is uh, a name, and then I have a procedure body, and then I said def, and then I sort of combine those together. So I define the name. Then I have a make adder, and the sort of nice thing now is that it's going to capture whatever I had on my stack inside a procedure that I can then just pass along like a value. Okay, uh, yes. Yes, I wanted to show you a little bit more about procedures uh, before we proceed to draw some things. Yes, right. 
So this is now a procedure for incrementing values. So I can do something like that. I can increment it as many times as I like. And as I uh, hinted at, um, you can do this thing where you can load the procedure body itself. So basically what I'm saying is don't call the procedure, just give me its definition. And once I have that, I can execute it on the stack. Yes. Okay. So I think we're going to move on to actually looking at how we can do, um, basically implement Henderson's combinators in PostScript. Uh, I'm not going to live code that because I'm, I would make too many mistakes, but I'm going to use it and show you some of the code. Right. So, yeah, no. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. So I have a PostScript uh, file called figures, and in that I have, well, here's my definition to draw uh, the letter F. So basically I just start somewhere and then I make a bunch of lines and then I make a stroke and then I'm done. Um, so let's try to call that. Again, I want to be somewhere on the page. And then I'm going to scale up a little bit because, uh, well, this is defined in terms of the unit square. So everything is very tiny. So I want to scale it up. And then I can do draw F, hopefully. And hopefully we're going to see an F over here. Yes, we have an F. Now, once I've scaled, uh, it affects the way that I translate things as well. So now I can't really, I can't do this 100, 100 things. Now it's going to be 2 and 0. Um, and maybe in 90 rotate, and then I can draw F again, and we have a rotated thing. Uh, so we're going to use this now. Yeah, I'm just going to. This command now is going to restore things so that these uh, scaling and translation things are sort of undone. And I didn't define that, so let's do erase page instead. Uh, yes. So these uh, are basically some simple figures. Uh, the implementation for Henderson's combinators are in this FGOPS file. Um, so I'm going to have to run that as well. So FGOPS run. That's sort of my import statement, if you like. Um, and yeah. And what I want to do to do was to, I wanted to have this create, I wanted to have these magical pictures that, that Henderson defined, right? So I, I want something that's going to accept a procedure that, uh, essentially something like draw f that can uh, uh, draw a figure, but then sort of uh, be able to stretch it according to some box that, that I provided, right? So it's going to consume a procedure that draws a picture, and then it's going to produce uh, another procedure that will accept the box and produce some rendering. And well, we're not going to walk through all this code because it's, I mean, it's PostScript. It's, it's largely unreadable. Uh, but um, I just wanted to show, show, give you the feel of how you might write it. And what is really, really important because you don't have anything to protect you is these comments, right? So it's comments driven development or something like that. You need to make absolutely sure that you know what's on the stack at any given time. Uh, and uh, well, my experience is that I screw it up a lot of times. Um, but hopefully it's not so bad now. Um, so a bunch of things to create this procedure. Let's use it. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to create Picture, so create picture. Okay, what's going on now? Um, so I'm going to create a new procedure that uh, is essentially this, uh, a name for whatever I was given once I've created a procedure from my draw-f procedure. There's a lot of procedures here. Um, let's see, 
Then I have a box, as I said. Now, I don't have much in terms of building uh, data structures in, in PostScript. Uh, so really a box is just uh, an array with three things in it, which are these vectors, which are also just arrays. So it's very untyped, very highly prone to crash when I mess it up. Uh, yes, let's see. So the idea is, if I done this right, I'm going to, okay, so I gave it a box, I have an F. Okay, now, not uh, terribly interesting until I start doing things with the box, right? Um, so what I might do is I might take this box, well, maybe just turn it once. And what's going to happen now is I'm going to get this turn thing, right? So I turned the box. Um, yes. And I also have our friend George, just the same load, create picture. What can I do with George? Well, well, let's see. I have George now. Um, I can, well, I cannot do that. I cannot call George because it accepts, uh, it uh, assumes I have a box on the stack. Uh, what I can do is I can load the definition of George onto the stack. And then I can create a copy of that. I can duplicate it. So now I have two Georges living on the stack, which are just these procedures to draw George when given a box. Okay, what can I do with that? I can, well, I have here, let's see if we can find turn. Well, this is my definition of turn for a picture now. It says, well, it has turn box, which is going to be executable, and then swap it with whatever is on the stack so that the box uh, is before the procedure and then compose those into another procedure. Um, okay, so I can do turn. Well, let's do turn twice. Basically, what happened now is I took my second copy of George, turned him twice over, and then if that's going to work, I'm going to do something like above. Okay, so now I had two Georges. I put them on top of each other. Now all I need is, do I have a box? I don't have a box, I just have this thing. Okay, so some box. Now I have a procedure and then a box on top, but that's the wrong order, so I need to exchange things. So now the box is below the other thing, and let's see, I can execute. And we have George on top of himself. Which is nice. Uh, let's see how we are for time. Yes, I think I should speed up probably. Um, I just wanted to do this quartered thing. Let's see if we can make that. Okay, so I'm gonna make a two by two grid uh, picture. The northwestern picture is going to be sort of top to the left. That's just going to be George. Uh, northeast is going to be George and he's going to be flipped and turned twice and the southwest is also going to be George. It's going to be turned twice, but not flipped. And finally, let's see, this is just going to be him flipped. Uh, it is a little bit cumbersome that I need to do this loading thing all the time, but that's how it is. So I'm going to load all the four pictures, then create a quartet out of it to create a single picture. So now I have a single picture on the stack. It's probably kind of complex, right? Um, and then did I have, I'm not sure if I cleared my page. And then I have George sort of fitting with himself. So great, um, let's take a look at some fish. We have like five minutes or something, right? right. Yes. It's kind of scary to build this entire recursive fish thing starting with just, well, now we're starting to look at the fish and there's five minutes left. Well, let's try. Um, so I have, do I have a fish? Yes, I have a fish. Uh, right, so it's, it's, it's a nice sign, isn't it, that, okay, uh, stack underflow is a sign of success or something like that, but yeah. Uh, um, so I have, if I put a box on top and then a fish, well, it's going to draw this fish, right? 
Um, yes. What can I do with that? Well, um, well, obviously I can sort of do these things to, to turn things over and stuff like that. Maybe we should look at these compositional things. So the t-tile, for instance. Now the t-tile, if you remember, that's the one that composed three fishes that sort of fit nicely with itself. And I think this reads very nicely, almost like a, a haiku or a poem. Uh, it says, okay, uh, duplicate, well, so, so dup, and then take now the topmost picture and toss it and flip it. And whatever you have then, dup that. So you create another copy, turn it three times and then over and over and you're done. So it's, it's quite concise and nice once you've sort of dispensed with all the ugly stuff uh, to build these abstractions, right? So let's try that. Uh, so fish load t tile. And that didn't work uh, because I wrote title. Now I do have, so fish load succeeded, uh, t title didn't succeed. So I can just do t tile now. And that gives me some complex uh, thing that represents the t tile, which is this thing, right? Yes. And similarly for the utile, I'm not going to bother to look at that. Um, I think maybe what we should do is, since we don't have so much time left, um, so 10 minutes? OK, great. Okay. Is that fine? 10 minutes, then we can do this in, in a nice pace, right? <laughs> oh, OK, right. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to be done in 10 minutes, OK? So, uh, yes. I had the t-tile, and now for the, the recursion, which is sort of the interesting uh, bit, I guess. Um, so let's see. Yes, side. OK, so this is, now if you recall, there was a, a, a base case and a recursive case for side. And it's the same thing here, really. Um, so this is how you do uh, branching, or one way to do branching. Uh, so it's going to assume that there is a picture and a number on top of the stack. And then because the if statement is going to consume my number, I'm going to have to duplicate that. Uh, and then if it's 0, um, then I'm going to go here and just get rid of whatever is on the stack and load the blank picture. Uh, more interestingly is the uh, recursive case here. So I'm going to decrement my n. And I'm going to do a recursive call and create a t-tile, uh, duplicate my t-tile because I needed two copies, turn one of them, and create a quartet. Uh, yes. Let's see how that works in practice. So uh, yes, I have my fish. Uh, basically, what I need is, well, maybe we should do this. Uh, this is going to be very, very boring now. All that work to show, well, it didn't really, didn't really render anything. Well, let's do instead this. Uh, so this is the first step of side, which has the t-tile and the turn t-tile. Mm. Now, it, the drawing isn't perfect. There's some uh, aliasing thing going on in the viewer. Uh, if you print it, it looks nice. Uh, in this uh, Go script viewer, it looks sort of clunky, but it's, well, that's, that's the tool I have to work with. Um, we can see that I, I create these recursive copies. And again, obviously. I can keep going as long as I like, right? Uh, same thing for corner. So I load my fish procedure. Um, I'm just going to do that without stepping through all the intermediate steps, just to show that we have what we need to build the square limit. 
Um, yes. So let's do that. Okay, so we can look at square limit as well. So square limit. Again, it's, at this point, it's not much more code than you would see in, if you wrote it in Elm or something like that, right? And you can sort of see the gist of it, even though there is this stack manipulation things going on. So you need a utile, and you need a side and a corner, and you need four variations of those for each corner and for each side. And then finally, you compose all of them into this uh, three by three grid. Uh, yes, uh, if I could find the so square limit. Oh, I, I drew it on top of itself without clearing it. So it doesn't look so nice. Uh, let's try. Yeah, that's better. Yes. And actually, I think I'm going to give it a slightly bigger box. I have some boxes uh, defined in the stuff that I imported. So this is now sort of Henderson's reproduction of uh, Escher's square limit uh, in, in PostScript, which is kind of nice. Um, What's really cool is that if you have like a high quality printer, uh, you can actually send this and have some really, really nice uh, printouts of this. I, I created one that was sort of, I, I did, it's too big to bring. So it was like uh, something like this uh, at, uh, at an art school, uh, which has access to like proper printers, which is pretty cool. Um, there's just one more thing that I wanted to show you. Uh, before we're done. So uh, one of the things that you might have noticed that is sort of missing in, in Henderson's reproduction uh, is, is the colors. Right? So it really is supposed to look like this. So I, I wanted to create a different kind of fish. Um, oh, well, I didn't clear it. Uh, let's see. So this is another kind of fish, which is colored. This is the black one, and then I have some uh, combinators that can sort of change uh, the coloring of the fish. So as you, can, as you might have noticed, I say some lens, and that's not sort of fancy functional programming lens, it's just uh, sort of, think of it as a colored box. So something that you could look at the fish through that can sort of, that you can change. Um, so one thing you might do is you might change the color of the fish image and then look at it through the, through the lens. And then you have a gray fish. And if you do that twice, you have a white fish. And it looks weird, but uh, that's because the background is white as well. Um, and when you have that, well, you can One thing is you can look at the t-tile. Uh, so it gets a little bit more com uh, complex. So that's why I didn't show you the code for that, uh, because there's, there are more variations that you need to, that you need to track. Uh, but then you might do, yes, let's do this big thing again. So So now you have a picture with colors as well. Yes, and um, well, if you're interested in PostScript at all, uh, you can, uh, for, for one thing is that there are lots of great resources. I mean, they're obviously old, but they're very well written. Um, my day job is not programming PostScript, uh, but I was able to at least do something uh, uh, vaguely interesting uh, with it uh, quite quickly. Um, the code is uh, available on GitHub if you're, if you're interested. Uh, basically, it's, it's here, so it's my name, I know, and then this rep, uh, repo, you can, uh, you can take a look at the code if you like, and you can also take a look at the code for the slides, which are obviously also written in PostScript, right? Uh, 
And that's all I got. Uh, any questions? Yes. Hi, thank Hi. you for the talk. Why do you choose PostScript and not some other front-end framework, I don't know, processing or some other JavaScript drawing framework? Uh, so the question was, why, why did I use PostScript? And uh, <laughs> I, I was sort of expecting that question. Uh, there are no good reasons uh, apart from, or maybe there are a few good reasons. Uh, one thing is this is sort of an evening project. Um, I thought Pro PostScript was an interesting language because it's uh, practically dead. Um, it's also a concatenative language, which is something I had never programmed in before, besides doing sort of bytecode things uh, uh, a long time ago. Um, so I wanted to learn the, sort of the paradigm. So I wanted to do, uh, um, sort of learn something about stack-based programming and concatenative languages. And I was fascinated by this language that uh, runs on all the printers out there, uh, or a lot of printers out there, so it's, uh, uh, yet it has had sort of, <laughs> it's, I, I think it's declining, so, uh, uh, well, but obviously you could have used any other uh, language you like to do this, so originally I wrote a version in F sharp, then I wrote a version in Elm, and then I thought, uh, because I read this thing, okay, I crowned uh, that, uh, Henderson, or Henderson, a student probably, uh, used the Java program to generate PostScript, and I thought it would be interesting to do like uh, what you could call full stack PostScript, right? Uh, which is probably full stack is not so good for a stack based language, but you, you get my point, yes. So, but you could, you could do it in any other language. You could do it directly in JavaScript if you like. Uh, you could do it in, yeah. So, mostly to uh, satisfy my own curiosity, I suppose, is the answer to that. Yes. Any other questions? If not, then we're done. And uh, I'm going to stay, stick around. So if there are any questions later on, you feel free to, uh, to talk to me or, or hit me up on Twitter or something like that. So thanks.